Welcome to the Numbers Game. I'm Jason. I'm here with Nick and Marty. How are we going today, fellas? Pumped up, Jace. The Matildas kicking butt. I don't know when this podcast goes out, but tonight's the semi-final <laughs> and my dog's in conniptions after we won the quarterfinal because everyone was jumping around the house and... Uh, yeah, the dog just uh, looks stressed out of its mind. So, But exciting stuff for Australia. It's good to see Australians coming together, getting pumped up about sport. So it certainly feels good at the moment. So hopefully by the time this goes out, we've won it, uh, which would be incredible. Going So feeling good. Uh, Nick, how are you going? Poor old Penny Lane. I think she's uh, between the Matildas and the Bombers. She's... Um... <laughs> Highly strung. You'll have to get her on anxiety tablets soon. I think they can do that for animals, can't they? Yeah, they can. They can? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've got a friend who's got a cat that's uh, consistently on um, anxiety pills. I'm going well. Sun shining. It's good. I've just got back from Brisbane. It was 28 degrees there at the time, um, which is officially still winter. And it was a 28 degree day, which I believe was even strange for Brisbane at that time of the year. It's usually low 20s, high teens. So feeling good, bit of a suntan, just, um, yeah, ready to uh, spend another hour with you boys. Love it. 100%. Well, guys, that's exciting. Uh, nice to talk about some nice weather. It's probably springtime almost by the time uh, this is rocking and rolling. Finals footy in Melbourne will be going off, and uh, life is good. There has been blue skies and sunshine, although this morning, um, as you said, Marty, we're on the day the Tillies play England. It was one degree in Melbourne, so that was quite fresh. But anyway, we're here. We're, we're recording content. We're excited to uh, get another episode on the way what's uh what are we touching on today marty before we hear about our show sponsor yeah well today we're going to explore the value of an idea and the drivers behind that idea and i'm uh, just going to talk a little bit about charlie's uh charlie's coin store that he went out and actually started selling coins to the general public which was exciting and uh, and i'm also talking about zimmerman uh who recently sold their business or had people investors buy them out as well as we work and uh, giving you some comparisons there. So it's going to be a, wow, a juicy wee. episode. No, so, very juicy sponsors, indeed. Sponsors, Jason. Sponsors. Oh, very juicy indeed. And since we're talking about money, Marty, there's no one else I'd rather say are proudly supporting this episode than the team at Innovate. Uh, all things money, this is your team to go to. If you need a big handout from, from a bank to get a property, um, if you're a business owner and you need some overdraft line of credit, some asset finance, and then as well, if you've got a pile of your own money that you need to invest, uh, the financial planning and wealth team are also there to help you out. So got all angles covered at Innovate, INO, VAYT.com.au. You need to go and book yourself a session with the team um, to figure out how they can make your money world absolutely dialed. So, Marty, talking all things money, I was very excited to see Charlie's coin store. Um, and I, I actually had a gut feel when I saw some stuff pop up on Facebook that we were going to end up in an app immersed in the life of Charlie's coin store and the lessons that were learned. So, um, talk to me about it, mate. I'm, I'm excited. Well, we, we want to educate him in all aspects of life and uh, the coin store is one component. But I always, I, I come back to it reinvigorated just things for me in regards to it's never only about the money. A lot of times we start business needing to make money. So you're very much in survival mode and uh, your cre- creativity and passion sometimes gets a bit laboured because you're so much concentrating on you know, making it work and making some Mula, but uh, the beauty of just seeing Charlie uh, do his coin store that was at Strathmore, which is around the Essendon area in Melbourne. Um, and I asked him, I said, "Why? Why do you love coins?" I said, "Why? Why do you love them?" And he goes, "It all starts with your first coin, Dad." He goes, "The history of it, um, the mintage, how much, how much mintage, how much have they released proof coins?" He goes, I love the research of it. Uh, I love to, the economics to know you can get them for this and I can sell them for that and no one knows about it or only other coin collectors know about it. And um, the community of people and just seeing his excitement about doing the research and the way he set up his stand and the connections he made even with the president of the coin uh, association, they gave him a free table Um he decked it out beautifully. He had a cash box. And I'd never see when he sold, he sold seven coins to one customer, which was absolutely incredible. So he sold about 120 bucks worth of coins and made $51 profit. And he just kept hanging on to the money. And I said, 
put it in the cash box. You don't just want to be waving your pineapple around here and get your $50. And he just couldn't let it go. And I, I said, look, put it in the cash box, please. And he goes, no, no. I, he goes, I've put so much effort in. I'm just so excited that something I love, other people love it enough to buy. And it really reinforced that, you know, really enforced the drivers as to, I guess, why you get into business. And for him, it was absolutely a passion and all the other elements sort of surrounded that passion and excitement about it. And um, and I just, I, it came back to the four things that always intrigued me about business was the drivers behind a good idea because everyone's got different drivers going into business. Um, your beliefs in that idea because if you don't believe in the idea, you'll never you'll never really congruently mm. sell it, or you won't have the enthusiasm in selling it as someone that does have a, a belief in the in the idea. The value of a good idea and how valuable that idea is to others. Um, I still am amazed that you can create value out of thin air on an idea and just executing on that idea. It still amazes me that that can be done and the power of executing on a good idea successfully. And the reason I bring that in is you see a lot of people with good ideas that never get off the ground mm -hmm. or they're not willing to put in the work. But something I realized with Charlie was it wasn't work. Like he made that money like, and it just wasn't work because he was so invigorated in what he was doing. And even the connections he was making, he met a school teacher, that loved coins, grade six school teacher, and she gave him some of her coins that she had duplicates on just because he was so passionate about it. And I thought, isn't that amazing when you love what you do as to how that really rubs off on people? And um, and I, I got to thinking about my own drivers in finance and I thought, always remember being in the milk bar back in the 80s and running the bread stand and being excited that I could do that. So similar sort of things playing out here with Charlie to be running the bread stand, the milk bar. But just the, just even with dad getting finance at the time and he was doing well in the milk bar and the finance got more expensive and seeing how annoyed he was. And I just thought about, um, he thought he was doing better and now he was being stripped, you know, from the bank. And, and that's a driver for me. So to me, when I got into finance, and got an understanding of finance, and particularly with mortgage broking, is I always thought that I could put people in a better position and they don't have to get annoyed and that actually makes them happier. So at a really you know, primitive foundation, that was the driver of putting people in better situations. And I remembered that enthusiasm through going through what Charlie went through, and that's why that industry resonated with myself because I thought I was literally, I think I have, literally helped families get into their dream homes and buy an investment and save the money, put money back into their pockets and not the bank's pockets. Banks are winning anyway, don't get me wrong. But that was the driver that allows you to work 12-hour days because you're excited about that. And I think, I think it's really good to ask yourself that question about why you do what you do and ensuring those drivers are there at some capacity because otherwise it's just numbers on a page, right? And it can feel a bit hollow if, um, yeah, if that's all it is. And I'll go into a few more things about this, but yeah, does that resonate, guys, in regards to why you do what you do or connecting in some way? Yeah, uh, 100%. I just think it's amazing that, um, that Charlie's picked that up at such a young age, and, and that's that's obviously very rare. And I think it's 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 rare that... Um, <clears throat> that young people are into business so that's probably um why charlie's unique and why he's going to be running innovate in probably about 10 to 15 years <laughs> but um yeah i i think it's awesome i think it gets to the core of you know and again i'm referring to charlie but there's no other there's nothing else he's thinking about he's not thinking about i've got to pay the bills he's not thinking about i've got to save money he's not thinking about i've got to get a big house <laughs> It's pure joy. It just happens to be business. So, and because it is pure joy, he loves it and he's doing it well. So yeah. it's, um, yeah, I think it's it's just raw that someone who's got no other connections to earning money and the yeah. fact that he's doing business, he can't help but do it because he loves it. And I, I think we lose a lot of that um, because of the responsibilities that we have and different motivations to earn money outside of because that's what we want to do. 
Well, even even with the fifty one dollars profit, he said, "I'm going to save half of it, and then the rest I'm going to, you know, obviously spend into doing things around the coins again." But he's going to put half of that profit away, just you know, just because he wanted to save it and feel that reward continue and compound that. So. Yeah, just just interesting. That was off his own back too. Mm. I didn't I didn't say anything around that. So I thought that was quite quite fun. So, so Marty, what's your opinion on this? Because I've heard um I can't remember who it was, but it was a guy that um popped up on social media. It was a guy that I respect just uh, around business. And, you know, you always hear all these famous people and uh successful people say, do what you're passionate about. Do what you're passionate about because that's how you'll earn money. Um, but I've heard numerous people that I respect in business say that's bullshit, yeah. <laughs> basically, because you know you, there's a thousand things you might be passionate about, but none of them can earn you money. And just because you're passionate about it, you might not be good at it. You know. So I've heard then other people say, "Well, make your your passion your hobby, but earn your money where you can actually earn your money and where where you can get the most out of your skill set." So you know, you boys both know I'm passionate about golf because I've spoken about it. But at no stage am I going to be, earning, be able to earn a good living out of golf. I like what I do, but is it a passion? No, it's definitely not. I dem- I enjoy it. So, how do you respond to that? Because um, yeah, I I would you know, be thinking I would be along the similar track to what you were saying there about where your capability is and where you can make money. And I think what Charlie reinvigorated was that feeling why I went into finance in the first place which was a passion of supporting people and families and that were my friends too, you know, my friends and, you know, like I, and this is probably a very simple way of looking at it. I really felt like I was helping people. So whether that was right or not, because I wasn't as analytical on that business sense, on that feeling, um, what it did was, was it made the work around it enjoyable. And I think that was the very thing that ended up making the money because the work was enjoyable because of my initial driver out of it. I think as I've got older, that's waned away a bit because it's become more about business and more about the you know the fundamentals of business. And if you're not always in direct sales, you're probably not mm. feeling that as much. So for me, that driver is now, um, yes, supporting business owners, almost relieving stress for business owners yeah. through funding and also supporting team members to actually connect into you know, enjoying what they do. So I, I get your point, and I've, I've questioned that point myself because I ebb and flow between the two, but I find when I'm really enthusiastic about what I'm doing from the right drivers, um, that's infectious. Mm. And people, people buy that, including the benefit that you're doing through the capability. So I think mm. you've got to have a mixture, mate. I really... Yeah, the more I'm thinking about it, there's a it's, mixture in it all. It's a real interest. It's an interesting conversation, isn't it? Because if you're not driven, then you're not going to succeed. But at the same Correct. time, what you're driven in might not be what you're best at. So, yeah, it's finding that combination. And I guess it means just continuously, if you're not happy in your work and your business mm. or whatever it is that you're doing, continue to search for new things until you find something that you're yeah. good at. And this, you've got the drive to do. And, this and was a good the angle question. I was about to take it and just yeah. say that you know we we onboard a lot of new business owners. Or sorry, we onboard business owners that come to us that they're, they're looking for a new accountant. And part of that is trying to discover what are they really looking for. Um, and Marty, looking at the the way your questions written, it was like I asked him why does he love coins. Um, you know, what one of the questions we ask a business when they come on board is why do they do what they do. Like what, why yeah. did they start a plumbing business or, you know, why do they sell baby clothes online? What, whatever the business is, why did, you, why did you start that business? Why do you do what you do? And usually there is a great backstory of, you know, how they got to be there, what the driver was. You know, hearing you talk, Marty, about your dad's business, I remember dad, dad ran a business, um, had a mowing and home maintenance business. And when GST was brought in, he went, stuff this, it's too hard, it's too complicated, I don't want to run a business anymore. And he closed his business down. And I think that stuck with me going like, oh, but it's actually not that confusing. I really get it. And I was like a grade six, year seven kid then. I understood numbers. I could do that. And I reckon that flowed on with me that I, I, you know, why do I do what I do? I get numbers. I like talking to people. I like helping people. Easy. The the next way I wanted to rework that question that I want to now add to our onboarding list when I talk to a business owner is not just why do you do what you do, but do you love what you do? 
and, and listening to what comes out of, do you love what you do? And if the answer isn't yes, it's, well, what, what about what you've created your job or your business? What don't you love? And then trying to reverse engineer how to help, how to help people fall in love with what they do again so that they can enjoy their day-to-day life. Like Charlie loves what he's doing. He's, he's amped. He believes in it. He's driven. And I think that comes from loving what you're doing and believing in it. If you're a business owner out there that doesn't love what you're doing anymore, how do we find a way to, to add that love back into it so that you can enjoy what you do? Because let's face it, we spend a big majority of our lives working every day. We might as well love what we do. Life's about enjoying your existence, right? So it's really, it's not just enjoying four weeks of the year when you have time off. So I go, if you haven't got that, then you've got to reinvigorate that in some way. You can do that where you're at too. You can actually start mm. to explore because sometimes you might be missing a piece of the puzzle that actually really connects you. But the question, and this is the more logical side of the self, is love what I do, but would I do it if I wasn't making money? And probably the answer is no, right? So there's still a business element in there where I go, you know, it still has to provide a return on effort that is more business like, but getting the drivers integrated um, sort of connects that in with me. So, but that's how I can distinguish. The driver still needs to be there, but also the reward for effort. Charlie had that as an absolute out of body experience. So, I'll, you know, I was rapt to see it when he got when he got paid for all his efforts. Like he just couldn't believe it. And I go, and that's how you want to feel. But we believe it because we know we need to. So it's like a little bit uh, unique. And and look, while while we're on this uh, topic, I was watching a fantastic. A uh, little mini series on WeWork. Um, it's called We Crashed. It's on Apple TV, and it's the journey of uh, Adam and Rebecca Newman, uh, who started up the company. And it was really interesting. With with Adam, um, he was pitching to investors all these crazy ideas, like babies with uh, padded kneecaps and these little jumpsuits. And he was pitching to investors, trying to sell these jumpsuits. And um, he's going to the investors well, do you think I'm going to be a successful business person? And they're going, well, I think you'll either be a billionaire or you'll be in jail because there's something disconnected with what you're trying to do. And his wife actually said it to him. He, his wife said, you're trying to get the money. She goes, all you're trying to do is get the money. And she goes, you've got to find meaning in what you do. And then with that, you'll you know the money will will absolutely come if it's a good idea but you haven't got that you need to find that and it was after the gfc that he was uh there was obviously a lot of commercial space vacant in the us um after the financial crisis and he had he'd rented out this room uh, that was just a storeroom and he was in this little storeroom and there was all this vacant office space and every day he'd sit with one chair in this unutilized office space. And then he came up with the concept of WeWork and and it was really interesting. He felt like he was a very isolated person. Um, he wanted to do well, but he didn't feel connected. So what he did was build a whole environment to the point where it was a cult in a co-working space. Like this was ridiculous stuff. This was like they'd be going to festivals, um, They'd bring people in. He said, you know, people want to work here. People will get married, finding their spouses here. This is a place for people to absolutely connect. And because there was, you know, a lot of freelancers coming through after the GFC because people had lost their jobs in the US, he saw a real interesting, you know, interesting um, market opportunity for him. And just the scaling of the business was quite extraordinary. Like we work, what, what does my head in? is that WeWork has never turned a profit since 2010 in starting through the whole through the whole cycle of business. But the amount of scale and the investors really encouraged him. Like one of the SoftBank investors um, invested 4.4 billion in the concept of WeWork. And they basically said to him, who do you think makes the money? People, the smart people or the crazy ones? So similar to Steve Jobs, right? And he goes, the crazy ones. And the investors are going, yeah, you've got to get more crazy. And what I recognized where they were getting him to scale and double. So anytime he was thinking about expanding you know, incrementally, they'd say, 
double it, double it, double it, um, to the point where it was turning over just before it tried to IPO. Uh, turnover was $1.8 billion and the loss for that year was $1.6 billion. Extraordinary the burn rate on on that business. Un, unbelievable. So if they were losing... Two point three million a week or something. It was it was something ridiculous about. It might have even been every three days in the end. But just just crazy stuff. And um, but it came out of an idea. It all came out of an idea that um, that he had and his wife had. And there was another founder as well, Miguel McKelly McKelvey. Um, and yeah. And then once they look when once they went to IPO. Like they had it at a price point of forty-seven million, but because you had to dig into all the financials, legitimately it was only worth ten billion. So it went from forty-seven billion to ten billion. Uh, but and they realised all the investors that he supported him being crazy said, "We got to get him out. We actually got to get him out so we can now corporatize it and make it work." And the fascinating part about that, like he ended up getting. I think it was one point six five billion, and um, so he made his money right. But now the market cap of WeWork is two hundred and fifty eight million. Like wow. it's never, it's never done any good. But he's walked away with one point six five billion on a financially undisciplined model. He saw himself as a tech company as Google, like changing the world. They were going to change the consciousness of the world through this workspace. But at the end of the day, it was just a co-working space and there was a heavy you know, heavy lease cost because they did long leases at mm. short-term tenants. So they were just hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging money. But even what got me was even like, I think it was Citibank. Um, he, he walked into Citibank and they said, you know, you've got, you've got a problem because all your value is in your business. You need personal credit so you can buy things personally. So he goes, yeah, even if I had 20 million personally, a lot of credit. They'd be good. No, no, you need a hundred million, and then that ended up at five hundred million on a personal line of credit, and he just leveraged it all up. So part of the buyout was he had to get five hundred million to pay that out, and but he's still got a billion bucks. But extraordinary, extraordinary story, and um, yeah, I'd encourage you to have a look at it because, and that's the balance we're talking about, Nick. Here, where you go. Passion with no financial responsibility, just... Mm. Well, he just, convinced people, didn't he? He convinced people. His passion was obviously um, enough to convince people to throw stupid amounts of cash at him. So, you know, and it's a much on a much lower level, I'm just thinking about sales, right? Like if you're passionate about sales, if you're passionate about accounting, Jay Smart, if you're passionate about finance and you're sitting in front of a client, well... They're going to go with you because you're so passionate about it, and that's yeah. exactly what's happened with him. He's got this idea, and he's this genius, possibly, and he's convinced people to throw millions and millions of dollars at him. So, it just goes to show the power of passion. And you yeah, know, it was the most overvalued company in the world. Yeah, like ever. in Charlie's case, he you know he probably sell a coin for maybe double than it's worth because he can tell the story. He's passionate yeah. about it, you know. And that's one of his concepts. He, you know, Charlie has to make 100% on what he gets the coin for because by the time you take out costs and stuff. But Charlie made more of a profit, but he didn't end up with a billion bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so so, uh, I, so that, that, that's, that's fascinating okay, to me. That's, that's okay. This that's just right. the coin challenge, Definitely. Strathmore. That's, that's right for now. For now. But, for now. Uh, but, but then the, the other thing, and I think the really other great business um, was Zimmerman. Uh, iconic Australian fashion brand with Nikki and Simone Zimmerman, um, and they've just been bought out, acquired by investment serv- uh, investment firm Advent for one point five to one point seven billion dollars. So again, they've got a similar result personally, right, in regards to what they've done. But they've been fiscally really responsible. Like they run, I think their net profit was two hundred and fifty six mil. They run at thirty um, percent net profit margin, fifty eight quality boutiques but again they started off with a trestle table in Paddington in New South Wales at a market and the desire was to make women feel pretty through floral designs in swimwear Uh, it's gone into obviously other boutique areas as well now 
But again, what I love about their story, it still came out of the passion of the idea and the enthusiasm around that idea. And they also had an amazing culture that just people wanted to be a part of, lighthearted. But um, but again, very, very disciplined and investors back them as well. But they've come out with the same result, even though the investors were obviously going to make a lot more money and it's a stronger business as well. And what I love about them is they're unapologetically Australian. So they, they're thinking most brands try and almost copycat a little bit what Europe wants in fashion mm. in order to get scale, but they realise that being Australian is a unique superpower, so they were absolutely all about being Australian, put in, putting themselves in that boutique market like Lululemon and uh, Pierre Cardin, all sorts of big brands. They were contemporaries to them, and I thought that was a brilliant, again, a brilliant idea and just the execution of the idea was very different to WeWork, but they got the same result. So like we're talking about, Nick, before, who's right or wrong? Maybe it yeah. is a combination in some way, right? <laughs> they got the same result and he probably got it a lot quicker. Um, <laughs> yeah. He probably got it with less effort, to be honest. So. They, they started, I think, in the 90s, late 90s. Yeah, so, there, yeah. You there you go. There you go. took the, a while. The common thing there was belief, I think. You know, what, what I say is believing in what you're doing, believing in the product, believing in the service. And if you back yourself and truly believe that you're you're doing something good – you get other people to follow you, other people to join in, other people to kind of listen to your story and, and want to buy in and be part of it, whether that's buy in as a customer or buy in from an investor point of view. But that, you know, again, one of those four things that you said intrigued you was belief, belief in the idea. And, you know, the Zimmerman story is a great one. I mean, that's a great business, great fundamentals, great profit margin, and they believed in what they were doing. That And, and the, you, I listened to other words, as you say, culture, passion, you know, so if you're sitting there as a business owner listening, going, you know, well, how do I get my business instead of turning over a couple of hundred grand or a few mil making some good profit? If you've got the belief or the desire to have a billion dollar company, you know, you've actually got to really believe that and put the steps in place to grow, grow what you're working on to that size. If you don't have the belief and you don't think you can do it, you won't do it. And it's definitely as simple as that. You look at the most successful companies in the world, it started with a leader who believed in what they were doing and believed in the journey yeah. and set the goal to become that size and they work towards it. It doesn't happen by accident. Yeah, and if you don't believe in what you do, why should anyone else? But then I think there's that flip and going, well, you also want to make sure you're not believing a delusion of the owner. So you still want legitimate capability uh, on execution as well, whether it's from a business level or even a salesperson, I think um, you know there's some people that are that can be delusional as well. So you've got to get that fine line of mixing the belief that's infectious, but also the capability on execution. And then you've got the perfect storm, and that's the sort of thing to contemplate on. Because I don't think anyone really sets out. Maybe some people do sets out wanting to make a billion dollars out of something. Usually, a lot of the times. Yeah, every day people set out with a great idea that they want to share out there in the market and see if people want to share that in return uh, by buying it. So it's um, yeah, and then it then it grows. So yeah, but I thought there were <laughs> three different situations: the pure passion of a young boy, you know, doing what he loves to do and seeing that expand. I'll be interested to see where it goes. To someone like you know Adam Newman at WeWork, um, give We Crashed a, a look. It's a great great series. And the Zimmerman ladies that were, you know, ultra impressive in every way in business. Um, I thought it was a good, uh, good mix to bring to the table today. Jets, good, good one. Uh, absolutely loved it, Marty. And as always, bringing the gold. Uh, thank you again for another episode of the Numbers Game. Thank you for your support and listening. Give us a like. Give us a follow. Send your feedback to us. And you can always find Nick, Marty, and I on Instagram, LinkedIn, all of the socials. And TikTok as a, for Marty. TikTok Don't for Marty. Marty's TikTok. Uh, X that's, that's or clock, Twitter, X or Twitter, depending if you're on it, and Threads. Jeez, there's too many options these days. But yeah, we're open book, Just always available. Um, or you know, as we learned in an earlier episode, sometimes ringing someone's phone number really works for you. Um, anyway, thanks again. Until next time, game over.